<clears throat> well, this is, uh, uh, my name is Jack Kittredge. Uh, to my right is my wife, Julie Rawson. We own and manage Many Hands Organic Farm here in Barrie, Massachusetts. Um, this is a perfect day for this workshop on fruit management because it's the end of February, about the time we begin our, our uh, pruning and, and our, uh, you know, our year of planning for, for fruit. Um, and what we wanted a little bit about the science of and then uh, lots of schools of pruning. So just take my what I have to say with a grain of salt because there are lots of other people with different thoughts about it. But uh, you probably will develop your own system that works for you and your own trees and your own lot. Um, Julie's going to talk about nutrition and, and management uh, in other ways, and then we're going to go out and. Uh, Try to do some, some actual on site uh, and management of food. Talk about pruning a little bit. Looks like it's a little bit down. So, in terms of uh, questions, um, in terms of questions, um, I think probably it would be better to. Uh, uh, at the end of my section, you know, has uh, you know a bunch of PowerPoint slides, maybe fifteen or so, and then um, and then ask your questions at that point, and then the same thing with Julie. You have another question and answer period, and then maybe we go outside. Um, but rather than, than um, break into the whole thing, if that works for people. Um, okay. Um, can you switch us to the uh, yeah. to the PowerPoint? <clears throat> okay, um, this is uh, basically our information on the farm and so forth, and, and if you get into this and you have some questions, we, we're certainly happy to have you email or, or even call with uh, some basic questions. It, it's just, you know, it's, it's pruning and managing trees is, is a bit of an art, and you don't necessarily get it all the first time, and, and uh, so it's something you want to uh, <clears throat> continue to, to study and, and learn from other people, I think, is been our experience. Um, this is uh, one of our apple trees. I just thought it was real pretty, the colors. Um, some cherries. We have a sour cherry tree. Oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Remember, it has a negative balance on it. <clears throat> is that what that meant? <laughs> I'm sorry. I think that's just somewhere. What? Not we get a reef. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Those trees all came from. I'm advancing there. You have to tell us when you're advancing. Okay. okay. Uh, all these trees, uh, we have about 100 trees here on our, on our farm. And, um, most of them are, are in, in production and so forth. So we have a little bit of experience with them. Um, but I want to go a little bit into the biology of, of fruit trees and uh, so people understand that. Most of I mean, all our trees came from seedlings that we bought from nurseries. We have, we have tried, you know, planting some that came from from uh, seeds and so forth, and without a great experience. And just in case people don't understand why that is, I want to go into a little bit of biology. Okay. Uh, basically, a fruit is the ripened ovum of a flower. So, the fruit, the flesh of a of a fruit that you eat, that you taste, that you think, oh, this is a wonderful peach, is all from the female, the mother of, of, the, uh, of the fruit. And the seeds inside of that fruit contain half mother and half father. That's the pollen, you know, is when the father has pollinated that. So if you plant those seeds that you see in that tomato, you'll get an entirely different tomato than the one you see around, wrapping around it. And that's a, a basic idea that, that fruit, just like all, you know, flowering plants and most everything else in nature, except for very small things is, is you know, reproduced by sexual reproduction. Uh, and that's a good device that, that nature has developed to uh, <clears throat> enable the propagation of species and, and the uh, survival and the improvement of species. But it means that when it comes to fruit trees, uh, if you try to plant the peach pit that you got from this delicious pit, from this delicious peach, you're not going to get the same tree, you're not going to get the same fruit. 
and uh, that's a basic fundamental thing that if, if you think about it, of course, it's obvious, but a lot of people don't necessarily think about it, and uh, you need to understand that. Um, so is that any, no, no issues with that, we get that, right? <laughs> okay, so no, basically no Next. Yeah. fruit <clears throat> seed bears true, um, and um, if you're going to basically try to plant you know, peach pits, which we have done in the past, you will get a peach tree, and but it's probably not going to taste as good as the one that you bought from the nursery. So if you're really interested in taste and production and so forth, I would recommend that you get, that you pay the bucks, the cost to buy a, a seedling tree until you really know how to graft your own. And then at that point, you can do that. But um, if you're interested in high quality fruit for eating, I think, you, you know, you, you don't want to cut the corner and, and uh, you want to go for the genetics that, that have been proven. Um, what what does a nursery do to make this to, to you know work around this fact? Basically, it grafts onto a rootstock a seedling that has come from the mother that you're very happy with the fruit of. So that um, this this illustration shows a rootstock, which is a different totally different, uh, comes from a totally different tree, and the what is called the scion, which is the, the part that will be producing the fruit. And those are two different trees, and they've been grafted together at that slot in the, in the, in the uh, low down on the trunk, and that's, that's what you will be getting. Here's a, uh, okay, you can click. here's a uh, example. You see there, there's a root stock that comes up from the ground, and then a little bit off is the graft union and that what comes up out of that is the scion and that's the tree that will be producing the fruit. Um, note that the, scion, that the rootstock comes up out of the soil and the scion does not touch the soil. If the scion touched the soil, if, the, if you had filled in six inches of soil around that, the scion itself would be starting to set some roots and you don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that the rootstock is the only one that, that is feeding uh, <clears throat> feeding that scion. Um, how does it? How do you do that? How do you? How do you graft something? I've certainly played around with grafting. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's you don't make a lot of successes always, but <coughs> it's a good thing to know. Um, basically, if you uh, can combine the there's a there's a layer of tree that is just inside the bark called the cambium, and that's the greenish layer it's maybe sometimes it's just paper thick maybe you know cardboard thick at the most um that wraps around the the dead wood inside the tree um here this this graphic shows um if you look at the the uh center graphic in the bottom there you can see we're looking down on the the rootstock um and you can see the outer layer there is, is the bark the layer just inside the bark before you get to the wood is called the cambium. That's the layer in which all the uh, fluids and sap and so forth are going up and down the tree. And that's where the life is. And you want to combine the cambium of the scion, the graft, the graft that you're putting on there with the, with the cambium of the rootstock. And if you do that successfully, um, the tree will feed the root will feed into the cambium of the scion and the scion will grow and the buds will sprout and you'll have leaves and fruit and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> it's basically it. And if you, once you get good at that, you can do it in just a minute or two. It doesn't take very long, but it's a, it's, it is a real art and you need to practice it if you're gonna do it. But whether you do it or not, or just buy the result from the, from the nursery, I think it's important to know how and why this is done. Um, <clears throat> Okay, why do you graft? Well, two basic reasons. For the first one I explained before, you want to clone the exact genetics from the mother. If you want to buy a, uh, a Reliance peach, we have a lot of Reliance peaches here because of the weather and we like the taste. If you want a Reliance peach, <clears throat> you want a Reliance, and you buy one in the, in the nursery, it'll be, the scion will be a Reliance peach and the, and the root will be who knows what. It'll be something different, but it's be designed to grow well here in this environment uh, for that for that um, for that peach the, the peach itself may be designed to grow in i don't know you know somewhere in north carolina or something but uh, the rootstock will be hardy enough that it will enable that peach to grow here and that's why they they 
do things. Um, so basically, to clone the exact genetics uh, that will produce the fruit that you like, like the mother is the first reason, and to take advantage of particular rootstocks is the second reason. The rootstock is generally the controlling uh, aspect of the tree size, its health, other qualities, and um, rootstocks will <clears throat> convey to the scion the, the, the ability to grow to the right size or to, or to grow in a particular environment with, uh, you know, insect and disease resistance or drought resistance or cold resistance, those kinds of things. And that's, and if you're into nurseries, then you're into knowing lots of different rootstocks and what you want and where the person is buying the stuff from. Ideally, and you'll have something that's designed for your for your old farm. Um, okay, that's basically um, <clears throat> the main reasons. You can go, you can step through one more. Another reason, other reasons to graft. Um, if you want to change your variety, so you you uh, once you get into this and you want to graft your own things, you say, well, that variety, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't happy with that and don't like the taste of it, and and if, especially if it's young. You can graft something else onto it and, and uh, change the variety once you get good at this. Um, if you want to optimize cross pollination and pollination because of pollination dates, maybe you know you've got things that you want that are not pollinating <clears throat> at the right time, and you want to change that. You can graft on new stock that will do that. You can benefit from interstock; those are you know grafts on on roots before you get to the to the scion that do extra things, you know, uh, that may, you know, accommodate your, your particular uh, area. Um, you want to perpetuate clones and in, in, uh, if, if cuttings don't take, I mean, most trees are going to do that. Um, if you want to produce certain kind of plant forms, um, oftentimes grafting will be a good way to make that happen. If you want to repair damaged plants, you know, increase, increase the growth rate of your seedlings uh, with something that there's a faster growing. Um, so there are a lot of other reasons to graph, and these won't come up initially for you probably unless you really get into this and really want to understand it and want to <clears throat> make a big a big effort to have an ideal kind of uh, orchard for yourselves. But there's it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you want to graft within a family. I mean, you want to graft apples to apples and peaches to peaches, but and apples are pretty easy. I've done that successfully in pears. Uh, peaches and other ones are more difficult, so they ha all have their own, you know, ways of grafting and so forth. But this, I think, is a hopefully it's helpful to understand the basic biology of what, what's happening. Okay, that's it on on uh, grafting, basically, and, and the biology. Um, some of the issues that you want to think about in in starting your orchard, if you don't have one yet, <coughs> siting is a, you know, is a crucial. <coughs> Uh, thing you want, uh, ideally from the tree's point of view, you want full sun uh, all day long. You want well-drained soil so the rain, uh, you know, percolates through it. The soil absorbs it, but doesn't, you know, keep it um, wet. It, it 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 dries out once the rain is done. Um, there is enough moisture either because it's in the you're in a rainy enough version, you know, site, which you are mostly in Massachusetts. We are. We don't, you know, we may. <coughs> bring water when we first plant a tree, but otherwise we don't. We just have enough rainfall, which if you don't have that, then, you know, places in California or something, you've got months without any rainfall you want to irrigate. Um, you also want to think about manageable surfaces. Um, most of our trees, virtually all of our trees, we have few dwarfs and semi-dwarfs, but most of them are standard trees which get big. And we use ladders to prune them and to do much of the harvesting, depending on the fruit. And so um, one of the important things that, that I think about when I prune is, you know, I need to set up ladders and they got to be next to the trunk. And if we got branches coming out everywhere, they're not going to fit very well. So I prune for some spots that ladders, you know, I, get, I can have access with ladders. Um, so things like that, um, you'll, you'll learn that issue. You, you know, when you're little, you don't, it doesn't matter too much, but as they get bigger, they'll begin to put out branches and. And, uh, you know, depending on how you mow, if you mow in your, your orchard, if you have um, <clears throat> low branches and you use a tractor to mow, you know, often you're going to have to cut out some of the low branches and think about pruning for, uh, for where you can do the mowing. Yeah. Still, um, can come again. Um, and you want good access to your trees. You don't want them on, uh, ideally, you want them on 
relatively flat land where you can get close enough with a truck or some other vehicle to, to you know, carry your ladders, you know, bring back your boxes of fruit, you know, move off the, the detritus that you, you've got from pruning. So <clears throat> um, access to your, to your orchard is, is an important piece of that. Um, think about how you're going to get there, how you're going to get back and you know, uh, most of us use some kind of mechanized vehicle to get out to towards the trees, and even if you have to walk the last 50 or 100 feet, uh, it's nice to have it, <clears throat> you know, be able to carry the, 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 the stuff going out to, to work on that and to come back, you know, all the fruit. Okay. Um, sizing, uh, as I mentioned before, that's really controlled by the rootstock primarily, and there are three primary uh, kinds of uh, trees you can get a standard a semi-dwarf and a dwarf what? um standard is, is the way trees grow in nature pretty much um, wait a minute <clears throat> maybe, maybe 25 feet tall they might get uh, they're healthier they're stronger than longer lasting than dwarfs and semi-dwarfs they are tall though and um even with ladders it's it, you know it's uh hard hard to get at them um, they're slower growing, so there's some downsides to it, and you need to think about your own situation and what you want to do. Commercial orchards have gone very heavily towards dwarf trees because they don't use ladders. Uh, they can get many more trees on a, on a acre, you know, if you put them closer together. They can, it's faster, you know, more, it's cheaper to harvest and to process and to harvest and so forth. So, uh, but they have a lot of problems because, you know, you, they don't, they're not strong. Semi dwarfs um, maybe might not get to get to 15 feet tall. Uh, you can uh, work with the ladders because they're not too tall. They grow more. They grow faster, but they're not as strong or healthy as standard trees. And the and the smallest the dwarfs maybe get to 10 feet or so. You can work from the ground from standing. Uh, it's very fast, uh, but they're very weak. Um, they're not often not going to be able to even support themselves because they just, just don't have the strength and you have to put some kind of a system wires or surround them with some sort of support structure. Uh, if you see a lot of commercial orchards, you know, they will have, you know, support structures because they're using dwarf trees. Can I just say something about that too? That sure. um, I think as we think about the, the mycorrhizal connection of the root uh, to, the, to the tree that the, the smaller rootstocks don't have this the same underground essentially don't have the same underground root system so they just have less capability to really extract um nutrients mm -hmm. that larger trees have besides besides falling over <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean something you need to think about and um you know we have gone for primarily standard as i said so that's what we're, we're, we're familiar with and can talk to you about uh, if you're interested in dwarfs and semi-dwarfs we have I think one or two semi dwarfs. I don't know that we have any dwarfs. That one pair um, that we have to. That one pair is a semi dwarf. Oh, is it? Yeah. That one's all um, racked up, held up with all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I spun wires around that to hold it up because I didn't think it was strong enough. That um, yeah, is a problem. But some people will prefer that and scared to death of ladders. And if you're scared to death of ladders, I, I would probably go to semi dwarf or dwarf because. Um, if you're, you know, if it's an apple, maybe you can shake it and bring the apples down. You're not going to damage them too much, but peaches and, you know, things like that are going to be pretty well, you know, destroyed if you shake them and they fall, you know, 20 feet to the ground and smash themselves. So, something to think about there. Um, <clears throat> spacing, you know, standard apple, maybe 30 feet between trees. Um, semi dwarf, maybe 15 feet and dwarfs 10 feet. And that of course is based on how, how uh, <clears throat> where the drip line will be. That is basically the edge, if you're looking down on the, on the tree and how, out, how far out the uh, <clears throat> branches will, will, will stretch. Um, peaches, maybe 20 feet. Standard pair, 20, semi-dwarf pair, 15. Sweet cherries, 30. Um, maybe sour cherries, 20. Those are just rough ideas, but um, Give you a sense of your sighting, your stuff, and, and where you want to do things. Um, also, of course, you, you need to think about what most a lot of fruit trees are are um, <clears throat> self fertile, but if you need something where you need pollination from another fruit of the same variety, then of course you need to think about 
keeping them next to each other or very close. So uh, even if you're just relying on wind blowing pollen, that it, it's, you're going to get a good pollination. Uh, if you have bees, it's, it's much better for us. Um, okay, uh, planting. This is just an illustration of you know, the old saying used to be don't put a ten dollar tree in a five dollar hole. Or, you, know, you don't get ten dollar trees anymore. Um, but if you're lucky to get a twenty dollar tree, but don't put it in a ten dollar hole. Uh, it's it's the probably the easiest way that you can make a mistake is to just get tired digging that hole. But the uh, <clears throat> the roots when you get a tree and you know it's shipped to you, often the roots will be uh, you know wrapped up and tightly in cord and they're sticking straight down. But by the time you unwrap them and fold them out, you know they may stretch three feet out. Some of them turn from the, from the, from the um, trunk and to dig a <clears throat> six foot hole is a pretty big deal. So you might trim them somewhat, but you want to make sure you have enough that you that most of those roots can not just go down, but also can can reach out. And um, it's it's pretty obvious once you think about it. But when you're out there and you're digging, you know, ten holes for the ten trees you probably uh, were optimistically bought, uh, you're going to get pretty tired if you dig those uh, holes. So, <clears throat> but it's worth it. Um, if you got some way to do it, you know, we often dig the holes ahead of time, knowing when the trees are going to come and take several days to do it or something like that. But, um, um, protection, you know, once you plant the tree, um, you, you want to mulch it, I think, against, you know, weeds and maintain moisture. It, it's when they need it, when they need moisture is when you just planted them and, and uh, you want to waken them up and make sure that they're they're <clears throat> uh, performing their function basically of, of you know surviving and photosynthesizing and, and drinking and so forth and uh, mulch uh, <clears throat> usually you're, you're planting them in sometime in late April or something like that so that you know, have real high hot days and you got a lot of rain so it's usually a reasonable time but if, but if you get a uh, mulch is it, it's a great help I think. Um, Flag them depending on your situation. You know, I just buy some cheap flag or flagging tape at the hardware store and put up a little stake by the tree and flag it because we mow with a tractor. And if you've got some, you know, somebody who isn't familiar with where the trees are, some kid you just hired that year, he's going to mow your tree down. And so you're going to, you know, you should yell at yourself for not flagging it, not him for making a mistake. Um, so protect them somehow. Um, you know, oftentimes I would would get a little piece of uh, <clears throat> fencing and, and wrap a little, you know, take a six feet put six feet piece of fencing and wrap it around the trees the first couple of years so that you can't even get near it with a mower and, and protect that. But whatever, be be conscious that that, that is an easy, easy problem to drive over to to uh, to mow them. And then visit, you know, as much as you can to see how they're growing. See what they need. Um, if there's a problem, they're leaning over. If they look like they're not getting enough to drink, um, you know, uh, they when you first put it in, there should be buds that are, um, you know, not breaking, but that are obvious. And and you will do a little bit of pruning, not much, to cut the cut things back to, to shape. Um, but then see if if those buds you identified earlier are growing, and and uh, just common sense really of looking at it and taking care of it like it's a like it's a newborn. Um, okay. Pruning, um, basically uh, you I use we use ladders. Uh, if you're gonna do anything that needs a ladder. Yeah. Um, there are pruning ladders that are three-legged ladders and it, it's much easier to get in close to the center of a tree if you just have one leg of the tripod the tripod that goes right next to the base of the tree and then the other two legs stand out. And they sell those as pruning ladders, and I think they're a good deal. Um, they sell yeah, every two feet, you know, eight, ten, twelve, you know, six foot, so forth. You might think about that, but step ladders also work. It's hard to get a regular straight ladder to find a comfortable place to lay that against a tree. Um, but you know, first couple of years you're not going to need a ladder, so find out what works for you. Um, pruning shears are basically little handheld things that um, uh, you know have a uh, maybe a, a, a reach of maybe three quarters of an inch at the, at the outset. And, uh, you know, you can just 
squeeze with your hand. And that's what you primarily use for almost everything in pruning. Um, they make ratcheting ones if, you're, if your hands are weak that, you know, you, you can work on this. And, What's that? I don't know if those people can see over here. Oh, okay. Well, the people can't see on the, on the video, even more important. I'll pass that around. Uh, a folding saw, which, uh, you know, basically folds out like this and, you know, is virtually, you can cut, you know, up to two, two inch uh, things pretty easily with that, very sharp. I just stick one of my one of each of my back pockets, the shears and the saw, and go up with you know go up the ladder. You're pretty much ready for anything. If you you can get loppers, the big the big you know pruning shears that are have two inch two foot handles or something. Uh, especially if you're working from the ground and you want to reach up, they're handy. Uh, you don't want to do a ladder stuff. And chainsaw, it's nice to have one on the property. You don't usually need it when you prune, but when you first go out there, you may find a particular problem if something has died, something is broken, um, you need you need maybe you may need a chainsaw for that. Um, all right, shapes basically there are three kinds of shapes. Central leader is on the left there. Basically that's the way the tree wants to grow generally, especially things like apples, uh, pears want to grow straight up with a central leader. Um, things that have more of a modified central leader is in the center there's not one that you can identify as really the, the key uh, top branch, but it makes more sort of a fan. The peaches tend to grow more that way. They tend to have a natural ability to fan out and to, to get sunlight better. Um, and then a, an open center, um, which is on the right, which gives you a lot of sunlight in the center. And I originally, when I was doing pruning, I thought that was a great idea, but when you do that, you're really fighting the trees a lot. The trees mostly want to go, at least with apple trees, they want to go with a central leader system. And you're going to get a huge number of water sprouts coming up in that middle. The trees are going to be saying, grow in the middle, grow in the middle. That's what we want the, the, the central leader. You know, one of you, 50 water sprouts is going to make it. And uh, so they're going to put as many water sprouts on there as you can. And there's a problem. So I would go with, I would tend to go with what the tree wants to do. And that's that central leaders with apples and pears and with uh, peaches, which are our, our other major tree, you know, go with what it wants to do. Um, you need to prune for height. So you need to give those things haircuts if they're getting beyond where you can go with the ladder. Because once you get past your, where you can reach with the ladder, you got no control and you want to be able to shape these trees all the way, all the time. So if you I think our tallest ladder is a 12 feet foot ladder, you know, when we're standing on the top of that, we go another six feet maybe, but you know, beyond that. Um, tractor bucket. Well, the tractor buckets, you got a tractor. If you got, have to have a cherry picker or something that you can bring in on a tractor, that, that's great. But uh, for most people with households, you know, you want to prune it down and, and keep it down and get it growing more out to the side. Okay, buds. Um, Here's an example of, you know, uh, you might want to look at it on the left is a growth bud. This, this is apple, I think. Um, and this is going to produce, you know, leaves and, and uh, wood, basically. And then the, and the, to, the, to the right, and more central there is a flower bud, which is going to produce the flower, which ultimately will produce the fruit. And you can see the different shape, the different size. Um, they're pretty identifiable, I think, once you get used to it. So it's handy to know what you're pruning if you're pruning off all the flower buds and and uh, anything else and make any fruit. Well, I mean, you have a hard time. Nature is very productive, as you know, and you're going to get a lot of flower buds no matter what you're doing. You'll be able to prune them all off, but that's a thought, you know, what you get. Um, water sprouts, I talked about those already there. Uh, <clears throat> they tend to grow straight up from a horizontal limb. Uh, they're, they're a problem with apple trees, particularly. Uh, basically, you have to cut them all off. I tend to I cut them all unless for some reason you want to let one survive and that will become a new central leader. But a lot of energy goes there. If you've got a lot of, a lot of them on your tree, you probably have a problem. There's too much sunlight coming down in that area. And you might think about what's growing above it and let something grow in there that's going to shade it. But if, if the tree is getting sunlight in a deep, low area in the tree in the center, it's going to produce a lot of water sprouts, is my experience, and that's a big problem. They don't, they go straight up, they don't produce fruit. They're attempting to, to correct a structural problem in the tree. And um, that's usually something that you cause by not pruning well in the first place. Um, 
maintain the apple leader. I've talked about that in the past. You see little red flags in this in this um, video. If you look closely, you can see they, those those are spots that will be pruned so that they are competing, basically competing with the central leader. So that if you take those out where the red flags are, the uh, central leader that's that's already there will be uh, much more identifiable, and that's what you want to do. You don't want five or six things competing like that, uh, especially in apple trees. Um, there's a thing called apical dominance. It means the, the top bud uh, wants to be dominant, and it actually produces a hormone that drains down to affect lower buds and slow their growth so that the top bud you know, gets to grow fastest and gets to continue to grow up. And you want to work with that and not, um, you know, and not try to circumvent it. Um, okay, I talked about pruning. Basically, you want to prune what's dead, diseased, drooping. Often they say is the three Ds. Um, there's an illustration there on the right. You know, things are going straight up and towards the beginning. Water sprouts or suckers. Take those out. Those are A. Broken branches or stubs. B. Take it if it's broken. If it's growing downward, you probably want to take it out too. It's not going to produce fruit. Crossing over or fighting um, with another branch, you need to take one of those out and, and let the dominant one have, the, have that space and that sunlight. Um, <clears throat> uh, if it's shading other branches, you know, deal with that somehow. Probably take that out the one that's shading. Whatever you think is the strongest, make sure they get sunlight. Um, competing leaders have talked about that already. Uh, Long slender growth in the center of the tree. Um, uh, you want to take, take that out. Um, and corals, where branches are growing in the same spot, basically, uh, right above each other, uh, it's a problem. There's a better view of that here. On the left, you've got a tree. If you're looking down, straight down on a tree, Next you know, tree. Yeah, sorry, yeah, there you go. Um, you want it to look like the left here eventually. It, it probably looks like the like on the right when it's uncurled. And you want to give each of those branches a little space to get sunlight to grow, to produce fruit. You don't want it so busy looking down. So that's a, if you can kind of imagine yourself on a balloon looking, you know, down at your tree, think about that kind of that view is, is what you are thinking about. And I think that is it for me. Um, so are there any any questions at this point? Any of this stuff that there might be some questions in the chat also. Do I see a hand over here? Yeah. Jane? Yeah. Question? Um you have to speak up. I'm a little hard of hearing. I am too. <laughs> oh good, good. <laughs> I'm also a mumbler. Um when you so if you're trying to let the apical bud be dominant and you know stick to the central leader, then how do you suggest keeping the tree short? How do you do what? Keep it short. How do you keep it, it short? short? Like how to balance Oh, if you, if you cut off the, the apex one, another one will soon say, oh, I'm apex now, just like right. the kids or anything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, maintaining it is not hard. It, just make sure that that the center, where you want the center leader is over the base of the tree, so it's not going to be tipping some way. And <clears throat> you can cut it three feet down or six feet down or something, and a new bud will become the dominant one. And you want to make sure that other things around it are lower, even if they're coming off different branches, they will have their own apical dominance. You know, each bud has it and it will produce that and, and slow down the ones below it. And that's so on different you're branches. So something way back, then do you also- You also need to cut down the things on the side, too. yeah. Okay. Because your, your, your central leader always needs to be the tallest. Okay. Not by much, six inches or something is fine. Okay. But you want to keep poking, the tree wants to focus all its growth on that because it wants to get sunlight and fight for that. And my experience, you want to go with the tree as much as possible. You don't want to fight it because yeah. you're just going to cut yourself out for an enormous amount of work. I don't know if there's time, but correcting past mistakes on older trees would be an Correcting of past mine. mistakes. Is, oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you do the best you can. And you say, well, you can, you can go out and look at some of our mistakes <coughs> when we get out there. Yeah, we started planning. Some of our mistakes. We bought this land in 1980, and we started planning, I think, probably that fall, uh, certainly the next spring, 1881. So we've got trees out there that are 40 years old, and mostly those are the ones I made my mistakes <coughs> with, trying to open them up too much in the center and stuff like that. So yeah. I mean, they still produce great apples, but I, you know, if you want to prune them well, I think you'll fight, you'll fight them more. 
And, uh, you know, I think, you know, if you want to casually manage your orchard, fine. You probably will not maximize your production, but if it's for home use, heck, you know, not a problem. Um, I would say, you know. We have um, one question in the chat, and then I want to, Dick also sorry, has a question. One question in the chat. Um, okay. Do you use wire mesh or white paint on the trunks? No, I don't. For some skull, there's there's a uh, well. Uh, <clears throat> I've used various things. You, there are issues of, and, and and rodents and so forth. There are issues that uh, they will teach you about protecting your trees from rodents, which you know burrow under the snow and like to gnaw the the bark and get at the the living cambium which is a problem, can be a problem. And also from sun skull, which is um, the sun coming down and burning the bark on the trees. Um, they, they recommend white paint on, to protect against sun skull and some kind of physical protection for trees. I often have bought and used these little uh, plastic tree guards, they call them. They're little uh, strips of thin plastic that wrap around and maybe uh, form a, uh, two or three foot tall spiral, um, hard to describe, but and you can easily wrap the tree in those and that, that gives us some protection against- It expands and, also, it expands with- Yeah, it easily expands, it, the tree will grow and it just squishes mm -hmm. itself apart because it's like wrapping a, you know, a bunch of things, or a slinky or something, but with each slinky wire being two inches tall, so it, it quickly manages it. But I don't, we haven't found it really necessary here. We don't, we have cats, we have dogs, uh, I don't think we really have a huge mole or, or mouse or rat problem with our trees. But if you have, you know, it doesn't hurt often the, the orchards will sell all this stuff. And, and if you want to, you know, um, you want to protect your trees and make sure that you, you don't make, do anything wrong, sure. Get them in. I mean, you can also uh, embed uh, hardware cloth around the tree trunk, which we did out in the pond because we were losing our we were using our willow trees out there. So we um, just put a hardware cloth around it. And then yeah, at those some are point those you have little to, half inch square holes. So, so you might have to cut it off, cut it away. It also goes into the tree. But um, yeah. it, it usually is a. I the probably out there was two. roving beavers that would come in. Yeah, take them down. I think this was a beaver farm. <laughs> um, Dick Simon also oh, had a question. Great, Th thank you. Th this is great. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is when you were talking about the six foot fencing around the trees for the first couple of years, you, you were referencing it because of tractors, but is it also helpful to create that physical barrier so that they're not like sort of delicious deer food or, or whatever else it might be? And then the second question, which you may be touching on later, but if not, I wanted to ask it, um, in terms of the best age to be, to be getting trees and what, what the trade-offs are. And thank you. Uh, first, first question: the, the the physical fencing. I have only used stuff. Uh, well, we, we've used stuff that hardware cloth, like Julie said, sometimes to protect. But when I was speaking of that, I was thinking of just something that flags the the tree for the human managers who are going to come by with a tractor or something and be be uh, <clears throat> daydreaming and not notice that, that there's a tree there. If there's, if there's a wire fence around it <clears throat> and a little red flagging tape on it, it kind of brings it to their attention. Um, but no, it doesn't hurt certainly to put a little uh, cage around the tree or something like that. You'll have to manage the weeds that grow up within it. And so, you'll, you know, um, those are little issues, but um, I, I didn't, don't, don't use it structurally for anything really. But to, because keeping we, away deer. What's that? You said to keep away deer. Well, deer are going to be, they're going to, you know, they're going to nibble on the buds no matter what you do, unless you, you know, have <laughs> Oh, containment system. Uh, we we have some deer in our, you know, our further trees. Uh, they'll nibble on the bud sometime in a bad year. But our dogs, uh, I don't think I don't know a good system for dealing with deer unless you're going to have you know a real serious fencing system, with electric fence and, and all that. I think deer are going to come and nibble and and <clears throat> if they're close to the house, they won't. You know, there are people with you know noisy systems that scare them away. But I think dogs are the smartest thing and. Uh, if, you, if you have dogs and they're out there, that's that's good. Um, the second question, I forget now. Uh, age. Age. Oh, how, how if, if you buy them younger, they're cheaper for, for buying the seedlings. Um, uh, 
uh, if you're in a real hurry, pay the extra five or ten bucks and get it. But, but uh, we generally buy the have always bought the cheaper ones, and we want to wait another year to get them. Um, so, it's, so what is the range in in ages that to consider? And it's the only trade off. It's more money if it's older, or are there are other. Well, probably two years would be the earliest, maybe, and maybe I don't know. You'd have to look. Well, say in the catalog. Um, <clears throat> You probably three or maybe if you get even a four, and that might be six feet tall or something. And the, the, the two year might be three feet, four feet tall. It's not a huge difference, but I think a trade off might be with the older trees is that it's going to be more of a shock for them to be moved. And so you have to consider that. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to dig a bigger hole to get a $20 or even a $30 hole for the bigger ones, maybe. Yeah. And is that shock trade off such that you would direct against getting a four year tree? I would. I think it's better to, generally speaking, to plant things smaller and younger and take better care of them. Okay. Thank um, you. That's my advice. Well, it depends how old you are and how, what you're, how, how long you can wait. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm doing that math too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yes. If you're grafting, with an older plant, does that work? Would it already be grafted? I'm sorry, if you're grafting? With an older tree. tree. Oh yeah, you can graft, uh, yeah, you can graft onto a hundred year old apple tree for sure. Uh, anything that's got a, a living cambium layer, a branch, you can you can cut that off, take a look, see if you see that little green growing area inside the bark, and if you do, you know, as that illustration showed, you split it, you know, take a, a, uh, a cutting from your cyan wood and, you know, the best way, well, there's lots of ways to do it, but one way they show is just to kind of do a chisel point on the end of that, stick it into the, the cleft you've made in the, in the, in the uh, tree branch and make sure you line up those green areas very precisely. And people tie them. They they you know melt wax to hold them in place. They put all kinds of ways to stay it together. Um, but as long as they that works and you protect that area from disease and so forth, come back a month later. If you've done done that in like late winter, early spring, you begin to see some growth happening in the bud. It's lots of fun to do and to play around with. If you and, you know, and if you actually have old apple trees on your property somewhere and you want to <clears throat> grab onto them rather than dig them and so forth it's well worth it to do that to, to get cyan wood and they do you know i know mosca in maine has a cyan wood exchange and people bring all kinds of varieties there and it's easy to get good cyan wood most people we ask around you got some you know they're, they're pruning apple trees they got plenty of cyan wood so yeah do you other questions yes a lot of, a lot of sprouts uh good for uh, graft you know, for, for the so cyan wood, the If you take off a water sprout, can you, you use take off water sprouts for cyan wood? To graft on something else. You can, you can, yeah. Um, you what you want is buds, and you want, you know, uh, no fruit buds on it, but it is there are buds. They will, grow. they will develop, I think. Yeah, I've never, I've never done that, but I mean, I've always taken, you know, more lateral branching wood for cyan wood when I've done it, but I think so. I think the tree has enough sense to. Uh, make those decisions, and it may, may not this year, but next year it may produce some fruiting buds. I mean, it, I think th those decisions are made by the tree in the late summer, yeah, as to where where the mm -hmm. sun hits the bark and so forth. And you'll say, oh, I should put a bud there next year. Mm -hmm. I I, I've had a lot of success using water sprouts for uh, cyan wood. Okay, that's Jack. He, he knows what he's talking about. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> line where yeah, I guess so. Okay. Let's, um, I'm going to talk about fertility management and uh, a few things that, and, and I, actually I was thinking about this, Jack and I actually have been at odds a lot over the years about pruning versus uh, fertility versus whatever, and like what counts and what matters and how, how things, um, which things impact the system. Um, so uh, it's interesting we have two people in charge of our project. Um, <laughs> interesting, yes, that's the word. <laughs> Um, so, but I'm going to talk about mulch, uh, cover crops, et cetera, animals, pasturing beneath, dry fertility, and foliar feeding. And, um, you know, we had a long time, a long uh, sp spread where we didn't get any apples 
uh, like for 20 years or something. We had peaches early on, pears early on, and never got any apples. And then we started a, a really much more um, intensive fertility program and now are getting apples pretty much every year. We had a couple of years in there where the uh, gypsy moth came through central mass really bad. That was uh, 17, 18, was it, I think? <laughs> And is 16, I don't know. Ago, well, well, 16, this, the spring of 16 is when it went down to six degrees in April after they'd been warm in February. And we lost, I think, uh, almost everybody in this part of the world lost all their peaches. For sure, we lost all of our peaches that year. But um, anyway, despite that, we've been doing much better with our apples. And, and um, this past year, we harvested tons of apples. I don't know how many we did. Um, <laughs> We, you know, made 600 quarts of applesauce and called it at that, and and then gave it out to our CSA for several weeks. I don't know. We, we had 150 people in our CSA and gave them out for maybe eight or ten weeks. So um, we we what's that? Oh, plus we made lots of cider. Yeah, uh, several you know lots and lots of gallons of cider. So um, we have we've been able to move um, toward actually getting apples now. Um, which is great, along with our pears and beaches. And sometimes we get plums, but not very often. And oftentimes we start with cherries and they're gone by the end of the season. So we haven't, by any stretch of the imagination, got it all dialed in, as they say. Um, but I want to just, I'll, I'll go through some of the stuff we do. So um, one of the, we're going to do this today, too. We're going to go out. We have cardboard out there waiting, and we have wood chips out there waiting. And one of the ways that we keep from having people drive over trees these days is to really mulch underneath them really heavily. And uh, one of the things that I have learned as we become a much more a no-till farm um, over the years, we weren't doing any kind of mulching like this back in the day, but we have started in the last, I don't know, five, six, five, six, seven years, you think, Claire? Um, it's been a while since we've been um, mulching under the trees, and and um, we were in a period where, which we're not in right now, but we were in a period of using um, free and natural farming, uh, you know, inoculants and such. Um, kind of got away from that because we figure we we are doing so much for fungal dominance right now that we don't really need to bring it in. But um, this is this shows us we we will put, lay down massive air. Uh, layers of cardboard and then on top of the cardboard we'll put uh, wood chips and that's us doing that earlier in the winter here on a couple of trees. Um, the major, there are several reasons to do it. One is that um, for some reason earthworms have a great affinity for cardboard and when you um, bring, a, bring cardboard into a situation you will attract the earthworms, which will then attract, they make a lot of um, air spaces and they also, every time they pull themselves through the dirt, they actually leave the soil healthier than when they started because they have a lot of microbes microbes in their in their system that will digest the dirt and pass it out the other end and all of a sudden you've got this amazing fertilizer. So worm castings, as many of you use them know, if you use worm castings are you know, super fertility. So that's one reason to do that is to really attract that. And then um, the other reason to the mulch is to keep it, um, keep the system under the tree more, uh, not so variable. We wanna have it, um, it'll stay moister, it'll stay cooler in the summertime. Um, it will just really even out the, the situation for the roots so that they can, they can um, <laughs> do a better job. Um, and then the hay or the wood chips on top, again, to sometimes it's to hold the cardboard down, but also to really just add more um, fungal dominance. Wood chips are a great, uh, a great thing to use, particularly in the orchard where you wanna have strong fungal dominance. Um, so um, then the cover crops, and here's something that I'll, I'll get that in a minute, but you see the comfrey on the left-hand side of that picture that I'm pointing out there. We have at various points run around and <clears throat> dug up some of our comfort, which is all over the farm now, and just par um, parked it underneath the trees in a circle underneath them. But um, it's just one of many, many plants that are great for the trees because it has a, as many multi layers of, um, first of all, it's highly fertility producing. It has a ability to kind of slough constantly. It's, it's constantly sloughing and, and um, building fertility, but it also has flowers and leaves to hide in. And, all sorts of beneficial um, places for uh, for uh, beneficial insects to hang out. 
which are then hopefully going to be working on some of the potential pests that we have up in the trees. Um, and here's another thing that we do. Um, we don't have cows at the moment, but we do bring our chickens and our turkeys through our orchards at least once every year. And they just, they're there in their mobile homes. I'll show you that picture in a minute, but we're able to keep the grass down at that level and also bring some more fertility into the system. And here are the, the mobile homes for the turkeys. Um, you can see that we go pretty close to those trees and, and uh, we're at the same time that we're enriching the grass um, between the trees, we have an incredibly uh, healthy orchard floor. Um, every time you go through there with an animal like that and the chickens will, um, particularly turkeys are good at it too, but they really will scratch and clean up bugs and then their manure will then um, enhance the fertility and then you'll have some of the more native species that may have disappeared over time will come back as and you build a much more diverse floor. They're only there for a day. Yeah, I was going to say they're only um, there for a day, so they don't. So don't yeah, so it's it's a it's a, a process called mob stocking where you really bring an animal in, you clean it down, you don't you don't take away the surface, and the, there's still grass when they leave, but um, they you know they get a lot of nutrition. You have a healthier bird, um, tastier Thanksgiving turkeys, etc. And you're also building the floor under the um, under the orchard. Uh, so here's something that we're going to do this year, and I um, I was the executive director of NOFA Master about 35 years, and I retired in August. Jack retired from his NOFA job in December, and we have a little more time for the farm now. And um, very excited this year as part of that to have more focus time on the proper use of perennial and annual really uh, cover crops and you know this we're just a vegetable uh, workshop I talked uh, about that on the vegetable side but this is really for the for the perennial side um, one of the things we're going to do this year is once we have all that mulch down the cardboard and the wood chips and luckily the wood chips we get from our local DPW are particularly this year very very um, broken down already they're somewhat compost already so we'll be planting um, cover crop seeds underneath all of those trees, um, and you'll see you'll see here what the what's in that particular mix. This is from the Green Cover Seed Company, and with that mix, we'll be able to um, again just more enhance what's going on under the tree. Also, um, those root systems that are going to be working in con um, in concert with the tree root systems are going to bring more the accessibility for more minerals. Into the um, into the whole process because that's how it works. When you're you have a lot of diversity of plants, there each has a different need for minerals, and, and they each call for different minerals, and they work with the bacteria who then proliferate. Um, it's a it's a very beautiful system. <laughs> so I uh, can't tell you that we've done this, except that we do have you know we have had many of our our comfrey and other things growing underneath our trees in the past, but this is a little more planned. Um, and then we'll mow, as it were, the, the path, the path, passage of ways will be mowed by the turkeys and the chickens. So, and sometimes we come in if we chickens and turkeys aren't there, we'll come in and make hay in there also. So we do do that. But under the trees themselves, we're going to see how this works to have um, this pretty mix. Um, so every fall, I do a a, a fall a, a cover. Uh, what's it called? A crop <laughs> soil test. And really find out where we're, how, where we stand in terms of our fertility needs. And there's a lot of conversation these days. If you're following uh, John Kemp and some of the um, people who are moving quickly on this topic about the the validity of actually doing soil tests and whether or not you should, uh, uh, you know, do a, do a standard soil test at all. It's a chemistry test essentially. And what we're really trying to do is build biology in the soil. And so sometimes. Um, with the advanced use of sap testing, which um, these folks at, at the Advancing Eco Agriculture and, and I think soon many other people are going to be using it, kind of tell you what's really going on in the plant more than, um, and it gives you a better sense of what is needed in the soil, um, it, it needed in the, for the crop system. So, but anyway, these are the things that we put on this year. Carbonatite is a really cool thing. It's a um, mined uh, rock, a mined, uh, 
rocks like like um, basalt is. It's uh, you know lying in ground. It's a I think it's from uh, old uh, seabed in like in Ontario. Essentially, Ontario was underwater at one point and um, many many years ago. And so there's a lot of it was an ocean floor. So there's a lot of great stuff, really good for for carbon um, and for um, calcium. calcium also. Yeah, manganese is a, is one of those things that uh, John Kemp will say really manganese. If you put it down in the soil, you're wasting your time because it completely becomes oxidized and unavailable. So he's suggesting more that you should do that in a whole year system, but we still put a little bit on the ground. Sulfur, um, an interesting uh, mineral that used to be in great quantities here because we had acid rain back in the day, but then we cleaned up our acid rain problem and sulfur, which is rather leachable and we have a lot of rain here is often a um, mineral that is, is weak. Um, you need sulfur in order to have complete protein um, uh, digestion, protein synthesis, it's called. And so um, that's something that often has to be put on. Boron is also another mineral that is often um, kind of weak in New England. Green sand is something we spent, uh, we had a little, we got some money from the feds like a lot of people did for COVID last year and decided to buy some green sand and some rock dust bulk. And green sand is a wonderful uh, soil conditioner um, that is a, a mine product. And then rock dust comes from locally, uh, Mount Tom, I think is where they get it from right now, uh, the place we're getting it from. But there were, I'll show you a picture of that. That does a lot to really condition the soil and it has 90 minerals in it. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, so we're gonna add a little potassium sulfate after um, fruit set. Um, according to SAP test, we actually need to take SAP tests this year to see what's really going on. And gypsum is another source of calcium and um, sulfur, particularly in the springtime. So those are our, our plan based on what we um, got our soil test. And here's just a picture of Claire and Anthony. Uh, we put all these buckets together of all these mixed minerals and we run around and drop them everywhere. Very fun, fun times. <laughs> um, and here we are, uh, Anthony's in the um, rock dust pile, digging it up. Uh, one of the things you should know is when you get rock dust, make sure you get it early enough in the fall that you can get it out really fast and don't leave it uncovered. <laughs> so it got, got wet and then it got hard. Oh. And, um, but anyway, we got all 22 tons out. We, we spread it all by, by the, uh, sometime in the end of December, was it? I think before the end of December, yeah. Um, but it was fun. And we, as you remember, there was a lot of snow in December, not much in January, but we had plenty and we were dumping, we were spraying it in the snow. But um, we, we noticed already just a, on the side about rock dust that we, are in our hoop houses, which we have five of, it's hard to keep the fertility in a good place because they're undercover. And one of our houses, particularly the soil was feeling really grainy and not very fertile. And um, we threw a bunch of rock dust in there. And then just yesterday we were in planting kale, I guess it was. And the soil has already, and maybe some of the green sand too, and the carbonatite too actually, but the soil has really just picked up a lot more um, uh, just sponginess and you know it was almost what are you saying it was greasy yeah. greasy yeah. Oh, yes. yeah 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 silky yeah. yeah. silky <laughs> and greasy for the touch which is a good thing so um i would suggest anybody get out get yourself a, a tractor a, a load we got 22 tons cost us a thousand dollars for the load um you know most of that was the trucking um and if you got a, a reasonable sized place you can use it on your vegetables and your fruit and once in a while every three four years Foliar feeding and sap testing. So here's the big change for us that we really got into foliar feeding in a big way. And I am extremely religious about this. <laughs> All the farm staff will tell you. Um, and we actually set it up this year. We were figuring out how to get this done because it's gotta be done early in the morning or late at night. And I'm too old and not strong enough to carry the backpack sprayer on my back anymore. So it needs to be early in the morning. So we actually have this plan where um, each of our five staff will take a day and get here and be out on the field at 6.30 to spray a certain portion of the orchard of the fields um, with our, of our foliar stuff. I can, we can show you later downstairs if you all want to see the sprayer. It's just a steel. Um, a steel is a, a good variety. We've, we've gone through a few in our time, but it's a really nice, um, it's a mist blower actually. So it's the one that people often use for spreading, spraying uh, pesticides and stuff. Um, 
but yeah, I do recommend the solo as well. A solo too. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a lighter, it's lighter to carry around. Yep. If you don't have a lot of trees, that would be a good option just because it's much easier to carry. Yeah. And again, we can we can show you all that later afterwards in the basement if you like what we have, what we're using for our, our sprayers. But um, so we work with Advancing Eco Agriculture and we have a consultant who helps us with our soil testing, our recipes for our foliars, our timing and evaluation of staff testing. Um, it's a free, um, the consulting is free and I think that they assume that they're gonna get money from you off, off their products and it's well worth um, their products, I think, are well worth it. So we get products from Tiny Wood Technologies too. These folks, these second secondary people here, are have been developing um, inoculants, really good inoculants, over the years for for decades. Uh, Bruce Tiny Wood was way way ahead of his time. He's dead now, been dead for quite a while. But he was thinking about inoculants in a way that everybody's talking about them now, but you know nobody was 30, 40 years ago. So, and just to give you a sense of what we're spending on fertility too, um, this is for our entire farm. The total bill for fertility for products in 2021 from AEA and, and um, Tiny O is $5,363. So, um, you know, so it's, a, it's a quite an investment. But last year we went from, uh, we had been doing about $40,000 in, in produce, et cetera. Last year we went up to 70, I think. Um, and we're hoping to go up again this year as we kind of dial in on this fertility stuff and really do it well. Um, and then the sap testing, which was a big bite. We were really chewing our fingernails, but and I think when we decided to do this, but we're gonna spend a thousand bucks each year on sap testing. And what happens is they they take this test, they send it to Iowa, Ohio, and they, they send it off to Denmark, is it? Or Netherlands, okay. Netherlands somewhere. And they get it back to you within a week and tell you, this is really what's going on. For example, did you know that you can get rid of you can get rid of uh, scab if you use appropriate amounts of cobalt, for example, as a foliar. I mean, there are all these little things that these guys, they can help you like dial in with this for that problem and get rid of these problems pretty quickly. As, uh, um, you know, and I think uh, the reason that AEA has been so successful, they've really taken the world by storm, not just in North America, is that when people use their products um, and they really have a very scientific background in what they're doing, um, they make more money. And that's, so that's our bottom line is to help people make more money. And by the way, you can sequester carbon and save the world and have good tasting food, et cetera, all those things too. Um, I, I just want to say a little bit thing about taste too, is that I was thinking about um, grape juice that we used to make grape juice. We still make grape juice, but we made it back in the day, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. It didn't taste very good, and we add a lot of honey to try to make it taste good. And um, now, uh, <laughs> well, we add honey to it. Um, and, and now, when we make, and I actually, if you stay for lunch, I got out some applesauce too. But the applesauce tastes like candy; it really does. And it's that's just apples sure. in water, you know, and that's it. And the grapes, and the, so you have an incredible increase in the flavor of your food. Um, Aside, aside from the fact that it, it grows better and you get more of it too. So it's just a win-win all the way across. Um, so I wanted to just share with you all these recipes and this will be, this is being recorded and it's gonna be up on the website next week, soon. In the next few days, probably. Yeah, next few days. Um, I just give a shout out to Maya and Ari over here. And the hats on there. <laughs> They do everything for us. <laughs> um, but these are the pro these are the recipes I get from AEA. And I would suggest if you really want to get serious about if you have a large enough operation or if you just have enough money and want to just really do as best as you can, I would encourage you to contact them and get yourself a consultant. But and I can share with you all my other recipes too for everything that you'd like. I'm happy to send those to you. Is this a drench we're going to do on the trees? The seasonal soil drench. So um, yeah, this is a, around the trees on the ground. And here it tells you, you do it four times. The price per app is 46 bucks, 61 cents per acre. Uh, start date on 515 and they do it uh, once a month for four months. So these are, these are the products that we would use here. Um, and these, the spectrum and the mycogenesis are the uh, products from uh, um, Tiny Home. Yeah. But they're basically, generally speaking, what you'll always find in these, in these, um, these uh, drenches and foliars is 
calcium, which is a big one. I mean, calcium, we don't have enough calcium in our soil. It's just way below what it needs to be. And we don't really talk about nitrogen, potash, and, um, and phosphorus so much as the NPK system, but really it's the calcium magnesium ratio. And generally speaking, calcium is low, low, low here. We, you know, this, this land has been since the, since the white people came in and started, you know, ravaging it and moving west. You know, some of the smarter people moved west, right? <laughs> 1830s, it's like, okay, we're out of here. We're gonna go, let's go Ohio. Ohio. Um, you know, the the kind of the the Anglo-Saxon way has been to kind of use it up and then move on. And for those people who stay here, we have to recognize that our souls are very, very thin and, and um, played out for the most part. Um, so we need to really think about how we're gonna bring back um, you know, the soil to where it could be and where we can really have high productivity like it was when people showed up in the 1600s and said the fish are jumping out of the sea, uh, out of the rivers and, you know, all this bounty everywhere and all the birds and all the, you know, incredible. I don't think we have a clue as to what, what life used to be like before, you know, before 1600. So the sea crop is, you know, sea minerals. Here's the whole cow is um, a big calcium to rejuvenate is really a lot of microbiology and the sea shield has some chitin, some crab shells, so there's some nitrogen in there. Um, so that's a soil drench that we do. And then at bud break and blossoming, it's like, wow, all this stuff we gotta do, how can we figure this out? You know, at first it was like, I'm overwhelmed, I'm not gonna do it. Let's do my press here. Can we just call and spray something once in a while? But um, we've really, you know, dialed in how to make that happen now. And um, so, this is the foliar for that time period. Um, uh, photomag is, has, has cobalt and molybdenum in it, um, which are, again, gonna be some of these micronutrients that you're not gonna see anywhere else. And, um, and the rebound manganese, which is gonna be the right way to um, really get manganese on is through a, a reduced manganese form. Manganese and iron, interestingly, are two, um, minerals that regardless of their presence in the soil and around here there's probably adequate iron in the soil if you look at an iron if you look at a soil sample however they're both really bound up they're in an oxidized form and one of the things that the AEA folks have found is that when they use mang manganese and iron in a reduced form in just very small quantities one pint that's not much right for an acre um, use it in really small quantities the manganese is really important for um, for photosynthesis, you have to break open the H2O uh, molecule to hydrogen and oxygen in, in order to have hydrolysis, which is really gets the photosynthesis going. And um, so that's why that's an essential part of it. And iron really is um, just like, uh, iron is this, it's the greening in the chlorophyll. I mean, it's the human blood is- Hemoglobin. Yeah. Yeah, like, the, the, as I understand it, the, uh, the <coughs> chemistry of, of uh, um, what is it called? <laughs> Chlorophyll. Um, manganese is a central atom in that, in that molecule. Man, uh, magnesium. Oh, I'm sorry. Mag oh, magnesium okay. is a central molecule. And iron yeah. is, is the same in hemoglobin. Right. Otherwise, a, they're very similar molecules. Right. But it's a real contributing factor into good photosynthesis. So, really, what we're trying to do is to have, um, you know, the best photosynthesis we possibly can. Um, we're trying to really help. Not only are we trying to um, improve the soil with fertility practices, but we're also trying to um, uh, improve the soil by improving photosynthesis. And because when plants are photosynthesizing at their highest level, they are able to then pour mood exudates into the ground, into the soil, into the, um, and then you start building deeper and deeper layers of soil. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to get to. It's that maximization of photosynthesis. And this one is photomag, that means photo, photosynthesis magnification, that's what that stands for. But, you know, a bunch of stuff in there. Um, so that's the, that's what we do at bud break and blossoming. And then we have the weekly fruit set foliar, um, and you can add all this up how much it costs. You know, that's the next thing that happens here. Um, and then the weekly fruit fill foliar. 
um, throwing a little bit of hollow pay. That's at that point where um, he says, according to the SAP analysis, we'll be checking to see how that's doing. But the potassium um, as needed when the food is trying to fill. That's a really important calcium. It, before um, the before the plant, the, when the fruit is just starting to set blossoms um, and do cell uh, formation, then you need lots of calcium in the system. And that's really important in springtime. And then as you move into fruit fill, then you, potassium takes over. Potassium and calcium can be um, antagonists. And we want to make sure that we don't have one too much potassium at the beginning will cause weakness and aphids and things like that. Um, and then um, you want to let the potassium step forward and become more important as you go into filling and filling the food. So these are all um, just it's fascinating stuff. And if you have any time, you know, go to the Advancing Eco Agriculture website. They have webinars. They have um, who's got a, John has a blog now. They have uh, the podcasts, and all these things are covered in excessive detail. Um, with a lot of different people who are really good at this stuff from all over the world, really. Um, they oftentimes will interview um, growers who, an interesting AEA came out of the really conventional agricultural world. Um, John's father, he's Amish, his father was a uh, fertilizer salesman, chemical salesman to the county. He was the guy. And they, they made this switch over from conventional chemical agriculture to organic agriculture. Well, they don't call it that, they call it biology, biological agriculture, really, as they started to recognize, you know, their, their weaknesses in both the conventional and, and in, in the organic systems, I think, and, and the biological agriculture is trying to kind of really meld those things together and really come up with what we're looking for is maximum, maximum photosynthesis and highest quality food and um, vegetable, you know, and flavor and health and then transferring that to the people who need it. Post harvest foliar. So I think the thing at the end of the season is to remember that as Jack said, that's what you said, yeah, we're making your decisions about what's gonna go on next year in the fall. And that's absolutely the case that, you know, we can say, all right, harvest the apples, that's it. Not gonna go back and worry about them until next year. But this is when we really have to start worrying about, sorry, you know, apples, the apples are getting pregnant again at that point. It's like, okay, Got to get that fertility, you know, keep that fertility really where it needs to be in the, in the fall. So um, that's the whole uh, the whole foliar plan, and I guess that's all I have. So maybe we can talk for like seven minutes, and we need to go outside. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So when you're planting the tree and making your hole, would you recommend any dry fertilizers for the hole? And you know, inoculants, all that. Well, what I would do is we have a transplant trench that we use. So when we get the trees, we um, mix up some of that in a five gallon bucket and throw it for the tree for a day. Yeah. With inoculants. Too. With inoculants. Yeah. And then yeah. and then pour that in the water in the hole once we plant it. Okay. Yeah. But no dry fertilizers. Usually. No, I wouldn't dry fertilizers in the hole aren't such a good idea, I don't think. I mean, those are nice to spread on the soil around and they'll work their way in slowly, but I don't think you want to hit them too hard with. Yeah, I think you want to encourage the roots to go out, right. to reach further than to stay right there in that spot. Okay. Um, okay, so one question. How tall do you let the grass grow in your orchard? Ah, well, we like to get the turkeys and or chickens in there um, before we have to mow it. Otherwise, we have to haul those big ass um, uh, houses over them by hand. <laughs> um, so let's say, how do we like, how tall we like to grow? For in terms of thinking, as lots, lots of things to consider. When we want to bring our chickens and turkeys through, we wouldn't want to grow much taller than that. This is six, 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 seven, eight, six eight, inches eight. or so, because that way they can get the maximum value of it from the from what the birds can, and also it doesn't break our houses when they move through. So um, if, if we're going to be making hay there, we might make it, let it go a little taller and then cut it for hay. Does that, uh, does that answer the question okay? Yeah. We don't always get around to it exactly when we need to. <laughs> um, is, are these recipes just for, sorry, uh, just for fruit trees or veg too? Those are just for fruit trees. And if, if you would like me to send my whole batch of recipes that Nathan gave me this year, just send me an email, um, send it to farm at imhoff.net and I'll 
happily send you the whole recipe package, but it's it's based for our system kind of. So, I mean, you know, it's not gonna be perfect just so you get that caveat that what you're getting is what we need here. And we've been at this for a long time, so we're in pretty good shape. I mean, I think we're, although with fruit trees, I mean, it's easy to, it's easier to grow really nice vegetables. It's much harder to grow really nice fruit. And um, we're still, I would say we're maybe 40% of where we could be 100%, you know, we used to be more around 10. So we're working we away. still use all the fruit we have that might not look like, it doesn't look like what people think of as right. an apple. Like yeah, as you mentioned, we, we are That's organic. We don't use any uh, yeah, forbidden chemicals. So we, a lot of our fruit would not be saleable at a, at a grocery store because it might have a little blemish, you know, a little black mark on it or something or whatever. So. But it was interesting. There was a great quote from a CSA member this year. Those apples didn't look like much, but I've never tasted anything better than that. And then, you know, when they started going away, after they had them for 10 weeks and it was like middle of November, and then we didn't have them that week, so we said, well, why didn't we get apples this week? <laughs> so, uh. um, Renee, the slides. This video is going to be on our YouTube channel, so you can see all the slides again, and also we can send this slide, this presentation to all of you to have, so you have all these resources. Um, another question, do you prefer bare root? I don't know bare what that means. Like yeah, you can, you can get, you can order trees that have basically are packed in soil and they have a big ball at the bottom. And um, I've never, I've never used them. I'm not sure what the advantage is, I guess, you know, um, maybe it's easier to, to do it, but yeah, we, we, used, we always get bare roots. They're probably more expensive. We probably, I'm sure they're we, more expensive. We probably yeah. just didn't look at that option. <laughs> and we probably need a, you know, some of them are pretty big. We need a heftier operation to get them in and certainly a bigger hole. Jack might know anything about bare about, about those, those Jack. I, I would definitely go bare root as well because uh, this way you have total control over the environment that you're putting those uh, roots into as opposed to you know getting something in a burlap bag and you know chances are uh that soil is going to be you know very heavy clay or it's just not going to be good as your soil i'm gonna go bare root for sure okay good thanks okay get it yep all right Anybody else? oh sorry jane um or do you have a question i have a suggestion and a question the yep. quick suggestion is um, something I learned from, um, I think they're called the feline permaculture or something in Vermont. Um, if you have, like, if you, if you've got time and you can plan out and you can do it a year in advance, um, it makes digging your holes easier if you put, like, um, compost plus mulch down and sort of the rain where your holes are going to be because it starts loosening up the soil ahead of time and then it makes it a lot easier to dig. And it already builds up the fertility a little bit. And then the other question I had was just like, just the practicality of like, how, how does it go in terms of, is the cardboard wood chip and then your plan for the pollinator mix? Like, just like the timing, like when are you laying down the cardboard and the wood chips and can you plant right away? Like put the seed down and expect it to rot and harm and all that. Like, how is that? Yeah, well, we, um, when we get to it, in terms of when we get it down. Right now we're trying to cardboard some of our vegetable fields and they need to they break down before we want to plant. So the right. trees are a little bit on the back burner right now. But um, I mean, and we, we're in this place now where we pretty much have, have done that every year for our trees. So when we go out, if we could see, you could see that there's still a nice big ring of hay or something around there. Most of the trees. So it's very mulched with hay. We yeah, had a lot of extra hay mulch. Yeah, which we, I we did cardboard exactly. and then hay on top. This year we're using wood chips, which I prefer. Which chips yeah. I prefer. Yeah. Hay is going to be. It just breaks down way too fast, and it often has grass seeds in it and stuff like that. So that wood chips are much better that way. Um, but I would, you think you would find if you don't have. Um, if your wood chips aren't very well broken down, I don't think your stuff's going to germinate in them. So you might, um, depending on how many trees you have, you might throw in a bunch of compost on top and plant into that, or even grab some soil out of the garden and throw some on top and plant in there. But, so you're planting right up under, like you're not keeping a certain radius of just mulch and then concrete or other plantings. Like we, we go right on, under the. Tree, it'll be um, right the from the inside the drip line 
question, I quite, we were discussing yesterday whether or not we want to put near the near the um, trunk or not, but definitely under the trip line in drip line and somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe keep the cinder free. Yeah. Um, another question from John: Do you worry about raising soil level with all the mulching and compost? Raising the soil level, um, it does get it's getting a little tall under some of those trees. <laughs> do I worry about it? <laughs> nah. you, you don't want to get you don't want to get beyond the root uh, the root part. You don't want to surround the uh, the scion part with soil because then it will start putting out roots. So I think that's that's the only real requirement. Do you have questions? Yeah, are you relying on like the pollinators to bring in those beneficial insects or do you ever like bring them in yourself? I know we have like a ladybug nest in our house one year and the guy came and I think he was selling them to a local farm. I don't know if. Yeah, I we don't yeah. bring them in. I mean, what I've understood about those those releases is that they often come in and then they take off again. <laughs> they don't like it. They're gone anyway. Yeah. And, and so I think what you really need to do is, I mean, we have all these nice uh, hedgerows and we have so many areas. I mean, I think, and we have po perennial pollinator strips in our gardens too that attract. So, I mean, I think keeping pollinator strips accessible um, is makes them very happy. There's so many local pollinators in New England that you know you don't really have to have bees. It, it's nice to have bees if you can, but bees are hard to keep and we have trouble with it. But it's lots of local pollinators that have been here since the, since the glaciers, I guess, and they, they do a good job. Yeah, hopefully the pollinator mix will be a long flowering season, but yeah. it's such a variety of different plants that will have things flowering over a very long season. And they'll have more to eat. Yeah, more nectar. All right, so we better probably head out. So we're going to head out. We're going to get our clothes on as fast as we can. We're going to go back and Claire's taking over. So folks on Zoom, we're going to set up a cell phone to go out to the orchard so you should be able to see what we're doing out in the orchard. So just give us a couple minutes to set that up.
Okay, we're back. Can you all hear? Yeah, you sound sound clear. Awesome. Thank you. I think so. Oh, here, I'll get this nice and close. This interesting uh, thing that you learn about the nodes and your are you know, closer together like that, that's a sign of better um, fertility. You don't want your, you, you don't want um, your, your plants to have long nodes, they don't have short, compact nodes. Yeah, and this is the fruiting one here. These are the tall, reddish shoots of the fruit, of the fruiting one that could be the mischief. Trees set more fruit than they can ripen. And we as much as we'll need to trim the other we'll trim these back fruit set because we'll also at some point we'll go and trim them. It'll ripen nice sized peaches and not very not very branches from the weight of Another interesting thing, I was just croissants, and if you can really just properly mineralize trees, you can gain yourself about six degrees of croissant, which is an amazing amount of, of degree. But, you know, like the apples last year, I don't know if other people got apples last year, but it was so cold, 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 and, and the, they turned pink. But then they sat there and they waited until it warmed up, and it wasn't until late May, I think, that they, they actually were they flowered maybe a month, a week late. Mm -hmm. late but, um, I think a, a lot of people did get lost in it. Yeah, and lost them, but we, we didn't lose any of our apples, and I think it's because of the by 
having a really strong mineral presence in it. So that's a thing to consider, another reason that you're going to um, improve your chances. So we're going to work on two things. Also back here. So, I mean, some of these are like, you know, to not get overwhelmed by looking at all of it. There's, there's a lot this tree um, and just kind of start thinking about the things that the branches you do want to keep and also start with the dead wood or any diseased wood or injured branches um, and also branches that are crossing. I think if you remove those things and then see what you have and where you might want to open it up a little bit more instead of I mean, it can be overwhelming to look at all of this at once. And we'll start off by identifying any dead wood um, in crossing branches. This also has a competing leader. So I think I'd like to take off um, the, that's on the north side on the left, looking at it from right here. And that'll open it up and maybe it'll straighten out a little bit, but maybe it, up near the top of the leader, it'll also fill in that area with another scaffold branch. Um, we want to keep these trees that are grown. You kind of want to, you don't want the outer branches, or you want the outer branches to be the widest. You don't want wider branches in the middle of the tree because that'll block the it's sort of like a conical and This is sort of the natural way to go. So this one is this one has a central leader. And you, I mean, you can see what the central leader is on this tree. I like this tree, it's huge. It almost is two trees at this point. Uh, but I, I think I still would keep that, like looking at the left side of the tree where there's that really big scaffold branch that almost looks like a leader. I, I think I'd still keep all of that. It's been out in the center of the tree a little bit, and there's a lot of crossing branches here, but I mean, yeah, this, I, I just was looking at how big this tree is. It's almost like it's two, two apple trees. With this one, would you prune that central leader to take it back? I, mean, I guess when we get up on the ladder, we can see Maybe maybe take it maybe ever take it back a little bit. You can have yeah. a lot of <laughs> I mean we often climb the trees as like these older trees. We do a lot of the work climbing in them. Um I mean this one doesn't have branches that you can get up on top. Yeah, I think we have to look at that after we take that out and see how high that other leader is. We could take it down a little bit. Um, can, you, can you just say why you chose the north one? I think the one, the so other looks bigger, and I think I think also the fact that those trees in the woods right there. I, I think that was the original that this is just a branch that came. It's that vertical growth that just came straight up. Um, I also would like to take off. Um, some of this is on the inside. And I want to take this branch off. So like off the top. And that's the inside. It's not heading from the back. I think I'd rather just take that off and open it up in the center of the tree for more airflow. And then there's also 
this right here, this vertical row, you want to encourage the um, growth to be going out from the tree. This is vertical growth, but this one is straight up. I'd like to take that out. Um, and because I think maybe turn back some of the On that higher band. Let's see, see what else we want to take off. I don't see much. Of this is right here. Um, does anyone else want to get up and do something? Thank you, thank you. Here's our bucket. So these are these are the tools that we use. We have chisel tools, uh, bigger tools like ladder. That would that would need a pruning saw. And these are these ladders what Jack was talking about. And the safest way to use these the easiest is to have that this leg facing into the tree. And also, but it's really important to have this side of the ladder level. Um, you don't want these two legs to be on, like if you're on a hillside, you can use these ladders on a hill, but you want these legs to be level with each other. I mean, this facing up into the tree. Otherwise, they can be um, let's see, so we have all these. Uh, I think I might that are going downward, like this right here, this, and this one is to blow up. This right here. This one is on the Branch, encourage these branches to go up and down. Here and get this rid of this. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go I think show everyone the water sprouts here. Let's see, this tree has a lot of water sprouts. But not not remove every vertical water spout on the, that tree. If anyone on Zoom has anything they want to see okay, or feel free to ask questions. Yeah, feel free to shout it out. We can't see the chat very well right now. Right now, on the ladder to cut this. Yes. Can you go over how to cut? Like, does it matter where to cut on a branch that you're removing? Yeah, so if it's a smaller branch, I think you could cut it. Um, let me grab a You can cut that right at the, right at the front. And you're going to leave, you're not going to cut that flush against the trunk. You want to leave a little bit of a taller. Yeah, you don't want to have. Another thing you can do is if you're cutting a heavier branch, is to cut it, cut a lot of it off, but leave maybe a foot. Because sometimes when you're, that one I think will be fine, but when you're cutting a heavier branch, sometimes it'll peel, but not as cutting the branch. It'll, the bark will peel down and we don't want to have that exposed bark. 
So you could cut it mostly, cut most of it off, and then just make that final cut if you care. But um, so on on smaller cuts, let me see what I want to cut. <laughs> But I can do with streamers. I'll just take this. So, um, yeah, so something like this, you can cut one to one. That would be a little bit smaller. Do um, you want to take this off with the saw? Yeah, you think so? Yeah. Yeah, like I was going to say, I was like, maybe. Don't. And so, yeah, you're not cutting that right up again. You can see where we've cut that before. Yeah. But so you, you have a little bit of a collar. You're not cutting right into the to the main stem yeah. there. You want to leave a little bit extra there? Cut it no, you can cut it. I think you can cut it right there. Right with the old one? Yeah. yeah. I know. So let's go check out the mulching operation over here. Julie, can you talk about talk to us about the mulching operation you're engaging in? So we've got the tractor running. Anybody wants to try mulching? It's a really complicated process. <laughs> So yeah, as Julie was saying, we're gonna come back on uh, come back on Monday and put another load down. So we like to have a lot of material down.
Okay, how long does it go? Someone have a question? Okay, great. Well, call, call me when you're done. Bye. Okay, let's go back to the pruning operation, see what's going on there. I got a question for you. Yeah. How many years has it been since that big apple's been pruned? Um, that, that one right there in the corner? Yeah, the one with the ladders around it? Yeah, let me, let's guess clear. The one you're pruning over there. I mean, it doesn't look like it was pruned last year, was it? Let's see, Claire, when was this, last, this tree last pruned? This was pruned last year. Oh, this really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Is that Jack Mashiani? I think oh, so. Okay. I think that one's called my journal and this Making that into one tree with that limb. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, is is that the, the tree that has you know, two limbs going off in a V shape? The two limbs coming off? Yeah, that's that one over there. That's oh, okay. Really, the trunk kind of splits really low and it goes up into almost two trees. But. Yeah. Yeah, that, that looks like a, a chainsaw needs to be taken to the left side and um, and just keep the, the right side as, as one tree. Okay. We'll have to think about that. I don't know if I was... Eventually that's going to break in two. Yeah. You think that left side will just break off? Yeah, it's, it looks, that, that's a pretty pretty big angle uh, that that's going to be likely break off with yeah. with uh, any kind of ice accumulation in the wind yeah there's still plenty of tree on the right my gosh i know the tree on the right it's 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 like full two full size trees <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i could try to get up Big one. So you're aiming to have one of those ones going straight up as the leader or? So this one, this one, I think this one wasn't as the leader. This is just a branch that's going off of it. So uh -huh. I'm gonna cut this right here and I think it'll open it up on this side. Uh -huh. Maybe the tree will straighten out a little bit having more space and Thank 
Pinchers, the way he's pushing it onto the slot. What? You gotta go on the other side and meet. Mm -hmm. He's leaning towards it, so it grabs the claws and leans down on it. Ups and downs of uh, standard size streets. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're back. So, hope you're still with us. We're going to go look at the peach trees. I might take some of the water spouts off in the center, but you 
leave a lot as well. Because I think they just put a lot more energy back into a lot of stuff. You can see this has a branch that broke last year during that branch is probably going pretty straight up and it was all the way to the feet just snapped right off. Um, and another thing we're gonna do on this shoot stage is to bring bring them down so that we can access the whole tree with the ladders because with peaches we do have to um go up in the thin and, and then it will also be useful during harvesting as well. So um we want to make sure with this tall ladder that we can get at all parts of the tree. But on this one we can, but um some of the other peach trees are getting pretty tall and we'll want to bring those down a little bit. So we really just cut off um that broken branch. How can you tell? Um, well, there's no, um, you can see the new growth on these that's kind of reddish. Has this, this uh, the, the new growth on the peaches is very red, and these shoots are what we're going to have to see on this year. And the dead wood is just a kind of desiccated, and um, there's no new growth. I want to trim things that are going straight into the tree. Make sure the center open a little bit. So you could take this out right now. Um, here's another dead. I think I might take this off just because it's going up. Um, some of this new growth that's very vigorous, we're gonna we're gonna take trim down. I think I'll take about a third of it off because this will set fruit along, you know, this whole um, spot, and that'll make it easier, a little bit easier when you're trimming. You have a little bit less to trim if you just trim those back. In. It's important to take off dead fruit that might have some uh, disease or some risk. You know. um, I think this right here, can anyone reach? I can move my ladder. It looks like this right here isn't very vigorous. I might turn that back to right here. Okay. So oh, when we're, yeah, when we're out pruning, um, I think that the new growth that's just a few inches we can leave, but it's these these bigger shoots like this that will will trim those down. Things like this right here, and this we might trim down a little bit. But a lot of the shoots, maybe this size, I'm gonna I'll leave some of the things that aren't quite quite as long. I'll leave. I think I'm gonna leave this whole shoot like this and not trim it down. So compared to like older. You're pointing to that new branch that's grown straight up that you want to get rid of, and next to it is an older growth. So, like, just in my mind, I'd be like, "Oh, new growth! I want to keep that." But no, it's more like where you look right, right about it, and a curve, and it has a mummy on it. But then, from above, oh. right? Oh yeah, that one. So that you're keeping that over the one you just. I think off. I'll trim. I think I'll trim it down, uh -huh. but not take the whole thing off. Okay. Yeah. 
anyone see any more branches that are very clearly like crossed? It seems like the way this tree has grown, the four main branches are very spread out, and that there's a lot of space here for all of that. I mean, that looks like it could be. Oh, I might take that branch. Are you going to get the close up? <laughs> Yeah, I mean the rest of the branch looks healthy. I don't know what do you think about wood that looks a little yeah, does it look like that's diseased wood or what's Jack think? <laughs> Jack, what do you think? This makes them just out of the way. Uh, I think one, one is shading what? out the other. What's that? I, I would take the, the bigger limb out and let that smaller diameter limb become um, more dominant. It's getting shaded out. It looks like it's getting shaded out by that bigger limb that's above it. Okay. All right. Whatever you say, Jack. <laughs> Feel free to shout them out if you've got more questions. We well, can't really see the chat right now, so you'll have to speak aloud. I think we might we might be questioned out. I got one for you. Where's one? How do you, what do you guys do about squirrels? I mean, that's the biggest for me. My my peaches, you know, squirrels eat almost every peach unless I can keep them away somehow. How many cats do you have? Uh one. But not interested in squirrels. There's huh. no, they have to cross a large open field to get to the trees. There's no other tall trees nearby. But I mean, I'll go out in the morning and see like four or five of them in the tree. I don't know what to say. Our, we have a lot of cats. We have a lot of dogs. Yeah. yeah. And um, I always find that if I feed them less, they're more interested in out, outdoor prey. Yeah, we have a lot of coyotes here, though. We can't leave the cat outside at night. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a hard one. I don't know. Our cats stay out at night and they're pretty sharp, but yeah, I think more, more of your local, local predators, then, because I mean, when you go out in the field, our cats and dogs all come out with us and they start hunting. That's just part of what they do. And they, you know, I think they get in that habit. I don't know. We don't have soil problems and it might be because we're surrounded by woods too. They have plenty of other things that they can eat. Um, we do have a porcupine that lives here that um, we see out once in a while on the tree, but <laughs> you know what? No one's going to put a broke him, but um, no. um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. Except keeping more of your own predators around and, and feeding them a little bit less than you'd like to. Just like I could like be more helpful. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we'll call it. And thank you all for coming. I hope you all come in person next time. Thank uh, you. We're going to go back and eat. And I guess then we're probably going to do, um, we haven't confirmed it yet, we're probably going to do small fruit next, next month if you want to come to that one. So um, it's been great having everyone. So thank you, Julie. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Julie. I do thank a lot of so seaweed much. spread too. We have seaweed here, which is great. <laughs>